Are y'all ready for the lure of the landscape? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Me too. Um, I just have to tell you, I just discovered something pretty unique and exciting. It's the first panel that I know of that we have all three panelists have green eyes. <laughs> Says something about the landscape, I guess. Complimentary to my blood show. <laughs> yeah, green and red, complimentary colors. So, well, so welcome to the panel. Today our speakers are from your left, Martin Blundell from Salt Lake City, Utah. Or thereabouts. Found a bountiful, even better. And, and right next to him is Susie Omblade from Arizona, multiple places. And Becky Pasha, all the way from Durango Bayfield, actually, Colorado. We've got a, a great panel, great uh, geography today. And um, how many of you love landscapes? Yeah. Something about, um, Beth did a great post the other day about um, art can take you away. You can travel without leaving your home by delving into the beautiful paintings you have, especially when they take us to beautiful landscape places like this. So um, I think I would love if we could start with you, Martin, and just go down the row and tell us how long you've been a professional artist and what's the favorite thing you love about what you do. Okay, I uh, graduated from the University of Utah with a fine art degree in 1975. It's a long time ago. Uh, but immediately after, I started a, a, a graphic design illustration business uh, and worked primarily in uh, ski, golf, high-end resort communities uh, in North America and Europe. We ran that business for 45 years or so, and, and um, uh, seven years ago, sold the business uh, is when I started to decide that I was going to actually paint paintings. It's not like I didn't know what I was doing, but I hadn't been painting paintings before that. Uh, so when I, before that, I had Kirk Randall had been at uh, uh, University of Utah, and we were in the honors program together at the U, and I knew he'd been down here doing this. And I actually ran into him at a at a forest fire near our home. <laughs> and because uh, we were, everybody went up to take a look at the burning. But uh, I said, hey, Kurt, you still doing it? He says, yeah, you should come down. So I was at a trade show, came down to look at the, the, uh, the show just for half a day. I ran into Becky, who had been here for her first year. Oh, wow. And so you were over here in the back, and all smiles. And I said to Becky, has this been good for you? She says, oh, yeah, this is so good. So uh, that helped me kind of make a decision to say, well, let me see if I can give it a go. So that's how I, uh, how, how I ended up here. This is my sixth year. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome. Susie. <laughs> Are you turned on? Hi. There we go. It's working. Uh, hi, I'm Susie Omblade. I'm a watercolorist. And I have been doing watercolors for 14 years, um, since a college trip back in 2010 to Italy. That's where I discovered my love of watercolor. It's probably the pizza yeah. that really fed. Um, and I've been a full-time artist for about five years. Wonderful. Thank you. Becky. Okay. I'll just turn it off. Oh, it was on all that time. Okay. Um, I'm the oddball that never meant to be an artist. Um, when I was 16, I got into an art class by mistake, and my first painting won like best of show for the whole district. And, um, actually, later, the school bought it from me, and it got stolen. So I, I've always felt that validated me. But I was always going to be an interior designer. My dad died when I was 12, and he was a phenomenal designer. And I was always going to follow in his footsteps. And I you know, would create little houses out of cardboard boxes for my stuffed animals with all his wallpaper samples and all this stuff and do a little drawing of the ball. And, you know, I just, I lived in that world. And then my high school teacher, I owe everything to her. She just kept saying, how about um, going to art school? And I'd go, no, no, I'm going to be interior designer. No, I really think you should try art school. And, and I just, I really just had to do what my dad did. You know, I just had to be his legacy. And um, when I got to, to college, I did do interior design, and I got my degree in that. 
And when I got out, I hated the shopping, and I just started painting for homes. And it was so much fun. I'd be like, I can rearrange your furniture into a painting that ties us all together, and then I don't have to go, <laughs> and I don't have to go shop for lamps. <laughs> you know, so, um, and I just started a business when I was 21, and I really never had a boss, and um, I've just been doing it ever since. And I really don't feel like I paint landscapes. I feel like I truly paint air. My goal is to paint the air between you and what you're looking at, and I don't care if it's a, you know, a field or a harbor or anything. I just, it's really for me about refreshing people, and my goal is just to enlighten everyone that I can. That's it. That's a lot. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, but you do, you paint air, you paint atmosphere, but what we're looking at are landscapes. So we'll we'll dive into that. So there's, um, you know, like I. Asked how many of you love landscapes. They take us away. They, there's a lot of serenity in landscapes for me. Um, a lot of boldness in your work, Martin. Um, I love your, your work. It's sort of abstract, yet we know exactly what we're looking at. So talk a little bit about your style and why, why the lure of the landscape is, is your calling. I, uh, if you talk to me in my studio, I uh, consider myself uh, a uh, uh, contemporary uh, landscape painter, contemporary realism, actually. Uh, so it gives me the opportunity to to uh, transcend both real, realism and, and abstraction a bit. Uh, the uh, uh, landscape has always been interesting to me because I work so much all over the, the you know the, the world here, especially in the West. Uh, I had a lot of work down here in Phoenix and, and other places, so I traveled down here a lot, saw the, saw the Southwest a lot, and it's such a unique uh, place. And you come from some, somewhere else and you really can't believe how, how, how amazing it is. So I was fascinated, fascinated by, the, uh, by, the, by the Southwest, and especially on the borderline of Arizona and Utah, what I call high desert area. Um, hence, in this painting, see the um, the plateau it's really the plateau world up there and, and uh, uh, we came down enough that I experienced some unbelievable uh, rainstorms some uh, amazing cloud formations storms that have come across I paint that a little bit now and uh, it's always uh, uh, something that if I can say this quickly um, I start and paint with a brush, organize the color, and then dump my resource material, which is usually a couple of photos and a couple of little uh, composition drawings, and then try to finish my memory and uh, with a palette knife. So the second half of the painting becomes much more subjective. Uh, all of the things that are subjective about art, really, like your memory, uh, like intuition, um, uh, feelings, experiences, I hope to have happen in the second half of the painting. Uh, being free from resource material uh, helps me um, not, be, not be married to uh, looking and, and painting or drawing. It's really coming from, from within, and I think the most important things in the painting come out uh, because it's already something I've experienced from my memory. This painting is a painting of farmland, so I bounce between the southwest and up in Idaho, Montana, Wyoming in the summer. Um, and I'm fascinated by just a little bit of an aerial view of, of, of farm. Uh, the patterns that are created uh, uh, inadvertently, I guess, by farmers. They plant and plow very precisely, but their buildings are always uh, a mess. <laughs> Not very well organized, but it's an interesting, uh, uh, interesting to me to see what man does with the landscape um, uh, in, in, the, in, in the big farm uh, uh, areas up in the uh, up in Idaho, Montana, Wyoming. So I bounce between those areas and, and uh, try to keep the color up. Don't paint with black. Don't paint with earth tones. Mix everything from a narrow palette of, of, of brighter colors. If you look at my studio, the color is always up in 
in, in all of the things which I'm, which I'm at, uh, looking for. And the ambiguity of what, uh, in mark making, with an, a palette knife. You can't paint really pine trees and be fussy about it, it with a palette knife. Uh, you have to be, it has to be uh, uh, something that, that becomes uh, more graphic, if you will, and, and uh, actually a little bit more ambiguous, which I think engage, engages the, uh, the viewer more. Do you do uh, um, any plein air painting, or do you? I've got a couple of friends, and we have a, they have a ranch up in Idaho. We go up every year, and these two girls want me to plein air paint with them, and so I do, but uh, it's not my general practice. I, I can do it. I can never finish a plein air paint. Outdoors, I always have to kind of fix it up a little bit in, in the studio later. Uh, I enjoy it uh, when I'm there. But most, 99.9% .9 of my paintings are done in the studio. Okay. And you, you've already kind of touched on it, but one of the things I love about your paintings is you do sort of have that aerial, almost like a topography. So we're looking this way, but you, you're, we're still seeing what lies beneath. And then the big skies, which you're sort of known for with that palette, brick, palette knife. Yeah, I, uh, artists all follow some of their favorite influences. I, I think everybody would say they have have some. And, and some of you will know the California painter, Richard Diebenkorn, uh, uh, has done some of it early on, back in the 50s, uh, did a bunch of paintings out of uh, photographs from an airplane. They were abstract, very abstract, not as, you wouldn't recognize them so much as a landscape, but uh, that was the influence that he had for, uh, uh, for a lot of his uh, painting career. Uh, and I've loved, I've loved the way he did that from an aerial perspective, but I also love the fact that he was kind of a messy painter. He, he wasn't fussy about his marks. He, he overpainted. He, he fixed edges back and forth from painting from the background uh, to the foreground. And, uh, uh, so, though he was an abstract painter, I think there's a little bit of Richard Diebenkorn in this painting. I don't know if any of you know him or no. Anybody know him? Yeah, ch check him out. He's a big time, big time California uh, abstract expressionist. So having a, everybody has a little bit of, of, uh, of that. Uh, you follow some painters because of what they do, how they do it, but then incorporate some of their ideas in your own work. Yeah, and as we talk about it a lot, art is really about how it makes you feel. And you really can feel the, the, the scenery, the, the feeling of that. So, um, we'll, I'm sure we'll have more questions for you, and we'll come back to you. But, Susie, you are a watercolorist, and you are a native Arizonan. Yes. You've traveled quite a bit, but you are a native Arizonan. So, um, behind you is the Canyon Lake. Uh, yes, Canyon right, Lake, Arizona. Ta tell us some of your favorite places to paint, and do you play there as well? Uh, well, I don't do too much plein air. If I do, um, in watercolor, it dries wicked fast. Yeah. So it's, it has to be a really tiny piece for it to work. A little steady, maybe? Uh, like, a, you know, 5 by 7 8 by 10 at the largest. And usually half the time, if it's 8 by 10 it doesn't look so good. So it has to be tiny. Um, and I usually use a lot of references as well. There you go. Um, for all my pieces. So most of the locations that you see in my work are places I have actually been. You have to get really close because they're telling me they can't hear you. How about now? There you go. Is that good? Ice cream can't cone. Hear me now. <laughs> yeah, so most of the paintings that I have are using references of places I've actually been to. So if I have a color study, I'll do that really small. And then I'll also have a lot of photography references that I take myself. So I'll have the memory of the colors, the reference with the colors of my small study that I did, and then also the photographs so I can get those details that my memory can't capture. Um, so for example, Canyon Lake right here, this is the first half of the lake, and I was on a pontoon my dad rented, and uh, we were about to go around that corner to the second half of the lake. And uh, it was a really warm day, but the water was cool, and I wanted to capture that warmth from the piece. Beautiful. And um, you also had a beautiful painting with the uh, the horses. What are we called? The wild horses out by uh, 
Oh, yeah. The Salt River Wild Horses last year. And, and this year you came in with your biggest painting ever. You might want to talk a little bit about that because it is like landscape personified. Yes. Yes. Talk a little bit about that painting and why you wanted to do that. Yeah, so the Salt River painting had three cowgirls on them and uh, they clearly got sold last year. Um, and the largest I had done up till the end of this uh, celebration last year was Canyon Lake. And then um, I ended up finding this massive frame that was beautiful. It looked like it was stolen from a castle. And uh, it was meant for a six by four foot painting. And I got it from my framer, uh, put my money down on it. And then I had to figure out, okay, well, how the heck am I going to do a watercolor in that size? So after a, a few months of puzzling it over, um, I found a company called Raymar, about 15 minutes that way on the highway, and um, they're, able to, they're able to take watercolor Fabriano 100% cotton paper and adhere it to an aluminum panel. So with that, I was able to pick it up in my dad's truck and uh, truck it over to my place and put it on the floor and then gingerly sit on it while I was painting. Um, and what I ended up putting in that massive frame was this uh, painting of a gorgeous sycamore tree that actually exists. It's a massive tree that takes about eight people to hug. And uh, about April, the beginning of April till the end of August, um, I was basically just painting that one piece and wow. a few smaller things for classes and stuff. But yeah, so the sycamore is over in my spot over that way. And where does the live sycamore live? The sycamore? The live sycamore, where does that live? So the massive uh, mother grand tree, the sycamore tree, is located on the East Verde River in Payson, Arizona, and um, in a small suburb called Beaver Valley, and uh, it's about two minutes hike from where I live. So I'm able to see it all the time, and I had a picnic under it, I felt like I was in a fairy tale. It's a really beautiful tree. That painting has a lot of significance. Some, some home is going to be blessed by having that little fairy tale come to life where they can look at it every day. Do you have, um, and this could be for each of you when you talk, uh, favorite places that you've been to that you just can't get enough of and you want to go back over and over and paint? The sycamore tree. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I couldn't just paint one. I've painted it dozens of times from different seasons. Um, but also I have a tiny one right there, 18 by 24. So that's the same species of tree, same river, but a different spot. Yeah. Oh, a four seasons quad drip would be interesting. That'd be cool. Is that a word? Quad, quad drip? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, well, we'll learn more about some of your other favorite places. And Becky, um, you are atmospheric and you bring an atmosphere of joy when you walk in the room, but all of your paintings really have that. I love the way you describe it. You're seeing, painting the air between the viewer and what they see. Talk more about that, how you do that. I think it honestly all started, I was actually trying to think about this. Um, when I, you're a little kid and we all draw that blue stripe at the top of the paper for the sky, and then that day dawns and you learn that actually the sky is all around you. We're walking through the sky, we're sitting on the sky, you know, I mean, it's, it's just the air all around us and it just looks blue out there. I mean, that is a fascinating thing to understand when you're a kid, you know. And so when I start looking at landscapes, I am just so obsessed with the sun coming up and down, a unique sunrise, unique sunset every single day. I mean, you talk about unique and genuine, that's just phenomenal. And the way that light comes through this air and hits things, I mean, I don't, it just makes me go, wow. <laughs> and so I want to thank that. And I think if I can just portray that in any way in my work, maybe I'll refresh people. You know, life is hard, we're all going through all this stuff, and it'd be just I just want them to look at my art and escape to some fictitious place, maybe, or connect to some memory they have, or um, and just take a deep breath. And so, I guess really for over 30 years, I've been trying to paint air, which they <laughs> constantly, but, um, and I use a big spatula to do it, because I do not want to paint detail. I, I try really hard not to. In fact, if I do, I usually take an exacto knife to the canvas. I have a video of a client doing just that. <laughs> Because I made her, I just, I'd, um, I'm not trying to show you where I've been. I want to trigger a memory in you. So, like for example, this painting, I've been told during the show 
that is Canada. That is so Canada. Oh my gosh, that is the Cascades in Washington. I've been there. It is Telluride, Colorado. And I, I just love that. But you know, I don't care what people think they are. You know, they say, what kind of flowers are those? I don't know. It's just, it's just the expression of nature, you know, on a mountain pass in Telluride, Colorado. But, um, and for me, who's afraid of heights, it's about adventuring off the edge of that cliff in a glider. What would it be like to fly through that valley? You know, so I feel like that is what I try to do. I want to take people somewhere where they're not really um, maybe able to go on their own. I travel a ton in my art. Somewhere that I could probably go back and take forever is uh, Cinque Terre, Italy. I mean, that, that water is so blue, and those buildings are just charming. It's like a stage set, and it's so fun to paint them all chunky monkey with all the laundry hanging out the windows. And it's just, you know, it's just... I love it. But, um, I think I just, a lot of us would go with you there. Yeah, let's go. No, I, so I, just, I really am just obsessed, I think, mostly with the sky and the air. I want my trees to look like they're blowing and my flowers to look like they're growing. I always tell people I paint birds, not nouns. I want them to look active. And, you know, so they look different at different times of day. And ten years from now, if you put it in a different room, you'll go, oh, I, that looks different to me now. You know, I just wanted to grow with you. So. I love that. You want your trees to be blowing and your flowers to be growing. To be growing. <laughs> but, and, yeah, let's write that down. Um, but I love the way you're capturing the air all around us. And you're right. How many of you did the blue sky and the green grass? And we left maybe a little white in between. And our flowers were not growing. They were very <coughs> static, probably. Um, but your, your style with that large... You don't even call it a halibut. You call it a. I call it a spatula. Spatula. She does all that with spatulas, and it's fun to watch because she's you kind of go back and forth and. I have to cover the whole canvas in 45 minutes or my paint dries. I use oils, but they're fast drying oils, so it's even if it's a four foot by eight foot painting, I'm sweating by the end. But I got to cover the whole canvas with my spatula and get it all slippery, and then I work into that surface. So I really paint the weather first the weather of the day, that, and those colors set the tone for the whole painting. So if it's going to be stormy, you know, you'll know from that first layer if I'm painting the storm. Or you'll know, like the poppy painting over here is totally just out of my head. I don't use a photo a lot. I try to make more from memory. But um, I just, uh, but you would have known that that was going to be a sunset or a sunrise right at the beginning. You would have known there was a pond in it, but there's nothing really in it yet. So that's kind of my favorite stage, that first layer. It's a lot of fun to start paintings. It's really hard to finish. <laughs> Your mind is beautiful, <laughs> uh, and you certainly um, get a lot of inspiration from our sunsets and sunrises. I mean, Arizona. I know there's lots of great sunsets, but um, we we often do sunset alerts here. Like everybody, go out front and look. And you'll see like eight or ten artists lined up outside, and then I always say. Be sure to turn around and look at the McDowell's and see what's happening over there while the sun is setting because you get that, that light. They turn the gent. Yeah, and that bouncing back and forth. Um, and then water is another thing I love about your paintings, that kind of the atmospheric water and the stormy look. How do you accomplish that? Well, I'm really, I think reflections are probably my absolute favorite thing to paint. I just love reflections in water. Um, for some reason, I have this mindset that water, rain paintings, and ocean paintings won't sell here. Oh. You guys think that's true? Who thinks I, that's true? Would, would you, you buy a water or ocean painting, anyone? That lives here in Arizona. I would. It's funny, when we yeah. plan our, you know, our inventory for the shows, what goes through our heads, it's probably so off base. But you try to think, you know, what are people going to want? You know? And you just can't imagine a big ocean picture selling in Arizona. So I don't get to paint them much here, but it is, I love to paint them. But, uh, I really just do it with that spatula, and it's a, I, I call it shimmy shimmy. <laughs> but it's like a shimmy, when I used to teach, I'm like, no, you got shimmy shimmy your spatula, and it's the up and down movement that makes it look like rain, or like the air. It's another technical yeah. phrase. Yeah, I have to Shimmy shimmy. <laughs> <laughs> with a spatula. Yeah. That's, that's a what have you loved most about uh, when you're teaching? I love that people can do it. You know, when you're painting um, with outlines, I never draw first. 
I am completely self-taught and unconventional. And because I'm really thinking in layers, I'm thinking in the weather, the atmosphere, the wind, the all those things you can't draw. And the second I draw, I suddenly have two shapes to fill in, and I'm already overwhelmed. It's like no, I got to do the whole canvas at once. So um, it was really fun to teach and see people able to draw it. They all loved it. They go home so proud of their painting because it was atmospheric and. You know, they got to use their colors, and it was a blast. I like that. I like that you can't separate the lines because then it makes you have to s stay within them. Maybe we should have Corey do the weather report with you on Monday. <laughs> Channel 10, Corey McCloskey will be here Monday afternoon. I'll paint from the weather report live. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking about atmosphere. So, um... One of the things that I love about this show is walking around and looking at people's palettes. And Martin, you already hit on like your your palette. All your your colors are very saturated, very bold, bright. You don't use any black at all. Do you prep your canvases? Never, those of you who are painters, my darkest values are created with uh, ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson. And if you mix a lot of that. Uh, without any other color, it can almost go black. It'll go to the blue side or the purple side. If you wanted it to go kind of black, mix a complement in there, then it'd even be blacker uh, or darker. But I try to avoid that. I'm not interested in local color, if you will. Uh, I'm, I'm more uh, interested in, in in creating what I call a piece of art, something that's different, something that's that uh, carries a a different uh, uh, analysis of what I'm looking at. Susan, in her, in her advertisement for this, I uh, brought up Paul Cezanne. Oh, yes. And, he's, and, she, and she wrote us this quote, to paint from nature is not to paint the subject, but to realize sensations. And I think that really talks about your work. Yeah. You know, I, I went over to Becky's place a week or two ago, and she said to me, I really think I'm regressing. I think, <laughs> she said, I think I'm painting worse than I've ever painted. No. This is what she was telling me. Uh, but then you look at this painting, and I think it's breathtaking. Yeah. So everybody, I think all the artists go through uh, these kinds of feelings, like, you you know what I mean, you're worthless. Uh, you know, the artist aches. Yeah. Uh, and we had a meeting this morning on, on Fridays. We have an artist meeting that, that um, Susan conducts. And, we were talking about quotes, and some of them were about artists. I didn't bring any up, but uh, I, uh, Van Gogh wrote to his brother. Uh, he, said, he, said, he said to his brother, uh, uh, I've given my whole heart and soul to art, uh, and in the process, I've lost my mind. <laughs> I'm not sure whether, I'd like to read the rest of the context, whether he was up or down, or whether he had a sense of humor, I'm not sure. Uh, I remember the quote, I, didn't, I can't remember which of his contemporaries it was, Manet or one of them, that was looking at Van Gogh's work one time and he said to him, to Van Gogh, he said, you paint too fast. And Van Gogh's answer, you look too fast. <laughs> I, I wasn't good. there, but I... I heard a good authority. He actually said that. I love that answer. Yeah. Well, so really, if you look at a at a, at a painting like this, I mean, there are red landscapes down here. There are red uh, yeah, buttes, right mountains. Yeah. That kind of stuff is not out of, out of out of the ordinary. But if you look at that cloud, it's really purple. I mean, it's it's painted from what we've just been talking about, and adding some white to it and some other colors, and so. Some people come around and ask me, is your favorite color purple? And I, and I say, well, I don't think of it as that way. Uh, there are a few people who have told me they hate purple. Uh, and, and, and not only men, but women. And so, you know, I kind of cross them off the list as potential, <laughs> potential buyers. You know? <laughs> but uh, uh, it suits my... Uh, I don't know, I love the idea of complementary colors, colors that help one another be stronger. Uh, so uh, I look for complementary color setups in, in the paintings, and, and I've, I've gotten a little looser than I was in the beginning of the show. Um, uh, the, the use of a palette knife and, and 
using my arm to paint rather than, my, rather than your hand to get a lot of paint on it and you know actually start a painting like this with a house house um, uh, a big two and a half inch and swipe it on there. I learned that from Matt Seifers being down here because he's <laughs> Matt. We were talking about Matt and I were talking about. How come I can't paint fast enough to keep up with you? Because I can't at all. Uh, and I feel like I'm always behind. Matt's always ahead. Because he uses all kinds of different tools. Uh, I haven't gone that route yet, but I have started to use much larger brushes, larger paints, larger tools, uh, bigger palette knives. Uh, and it sort of helped me execute paintings uh, a little faster, a little freer which I think is something that I'm learning, and I, I expect to keep learning as an artist. I tell all these people that come around and tell me, oh, I'm taking classes, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And I, you know, I'm, I'm doing watercolor, I'm doing oil, I'm doing the acrylic. And I said, you know, that's really, I always say to them, that's really good, you're doing it. You're getting some instruction, you're, you're seeing how other people work. But I always say, ultimately, if you want to be an artist, you're going to be self-taught. You're going to have to figure out how you think, how you act, how you, how your body works, uh, all those kinds of of your own idiosyncratic methods, uh, and, and you need to find out as soon as you can so that you can have your own voice. It's not beautiful to see somebody painting like somebody else. Uh, uh, it's great it's nervous that I'm going to start painting uh, lemmas <laughs> or or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, the flowers and the bases. But it, it, it's this thing, it does, it doesn't well. Uh, but I think that that it's important to press yourself and continue to, to learn and develop. Uh, and don't get too complacent about uh, about where you are. Not like you're going to go totally off on another tangent, but keep refining not only the way your head works, but the way your dance works. I love that you talk about painting with your whole arm instead of just the hand. Because yeah. that really does. That well, that has that. to do that yeah. the way you think. By the way, I think you could do a lemon tree. <laughs> and by the way, there are so many amazing artists in the show, many great landscape painters. So it's, it's sometimes hard to choose the panel because I don't want to leave people out. But it was important to sort of have a a cross section of styles here. I mean, obviously, Matt and uh, Heidi's a fabulous landscape painter. Um, Kim Ballard, I mean, they're, we've got a tent full of them, but um, showing a little bit of variety is really, I think, interesting. And, and hearing how different people approach the landscape is, is really key. So, uh, being the watercolorist, I know you, your, your paints dry fast. Um, very fast. You're 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 not doing plain air. Maybe a little sketch. Um, I think sometimes the little paintings are really precious. That um, I know when when we travel, we always like to pick up some art, and, and there's places where you could just get little memories that are done on the spot by the watercolor. But anyway, you like to make big though. Now that you discover you can, will you do another piece that large? I think I will. Um, I'm planning on doing some, hoping to do two or three that size, four by six feet. Uh, now that I know that Raymar exists, it's so much easier than stretching it myself. Um, but the, doing the small ones, though, is, is a great way to get the colors out because if I, even though it's a larger size and those pieces are made for me um, at a six by four foot size, Doing the studies is a great way to make sure that I got the colors down correctly. So I can't just go willy nilly and put all those beautiful <laughs> atmospherics down first, because once you put a color down in watercolor, you can't go back. So you can go darker, but you can't go lighter. So I have to plan ahead. Where do I want my highlights to be? Where do I want the paper to show through for my brightest white? Um, and I have to. I'm like, you don't like using a pencil to sketch things in. I have to because I need to plan ahead. So it's a very different approach. That's what I love about art. It's, there, there's no one way to do it. Um, everybody's unique and different. And um, again, walking around this tent, 
<laughs> you can see all almost everything you can imagine in that. But yeah, the watercolors do have to plan ahead, especially if you want to use white. If you don't have white paint. I know there's some trade secrets to getting the white show through, but that's true. Yeah. So one thing I teach my students at the college in Payson is I tell them that no matter what paint you use, the white that paint will always be brighter because it's something about the cotton um, knit or the, the use that they have. It just it doesn't absorb any light. It, it just shines it back. And it's kind of like how some people paint on like silver or gold leaf. Yeah. Similar concept. Well, and, and and literally every painting is about light, right? Yes. Yeah. Actually, light you have a painting, and that's yeah, Thomas Pinkney. Yep. Uh, and there's been so many great. Well, he went a little. <laughs> uh, I knew him before early on. Yeah, a long, long time ago. Yeah. Thomas Kincaid was a very good painter yeah. before he started doing these happy yeah. little scenes. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. But his early work. Yeah. Not... He was with uh, Richard Thompson, an uh, impressionist painter back, he introduced some of them back in the day. But um, but yeah, I mean, every painting is about light, it's about reflection, and your different media determines how you're going to get the light and reflection. Um, how do you, if you want to highlight a spot, what do you do? What's your go to? It's kind of like, like um, when you want something to stand out, you have to give it a backdrop. You know, like if your leading lady's going to wear red, you're not going to have a red backdrop on the stage, right? You'd want like an olive green or something totally opposite to make her pop. So if you're going to highlight something, make sure it's the opposite, murky, a little bit of murky around there, and then that will zing. And a lot of times, a fun circuit to create is you just use white, let it dry, and then go over it with the glaze, like a light yellow glaze, and it will look on fire. It's super fun to do that. But one thing I forgot to mention, my favorite thing about landscape art is creating distance. That is the number one thing to me that, like, I think I've shared once before, I got to see Turner's work in person, and he's my favorite artist, you know, way back when. It, it just, I just started crying in front of them. They were so excited. William Turner. William Turner. Yeah, back in the 18th century. He, he's, he was before the Impressionists. But as he lost his vision, his paintings got so atmospheric. It's, I can't even explain them. I still could cry thinking. Uh, they just have this warmth, and you, you're there. And yet, it's, you're looking at almost nothing. I mean, the people are like the little scribbles, and, you know, but the air is flying. And I don't know, you just feel like you're there. It's very sensory, like Cezanne has said. But um, I. Uh, I think his distance is so amazing how it, it just gets so faded away to nothing in the background and then it gets more and more rich and clear up front. Um, so it's really important to use cool colors in the back and warm colors in the front and just try to make that person feel like they are looking across that vista, even though they're standing in their dining room. A big painting can make your room feel bigger. People always think, oh, I have no walls, I have no walls, you know, I have to get a little tiny painting and think, actually, if you rearrange and got the right painting, your room is bigger. It's, they, you, it's like a window to where you want to go, you know? So um, I just that's a challenge I just love. I love trying to make this. You know, Susan, you talked about paint. Where do you go to paint? What's your favorite subject? And, you know, Cezanne painted Mont-Saint-Victoire uh, uh, Mont hundreds of times. Hundreds of times he painted the same mountain. Uh, and I had a, I sold a painting to a, a dog up in, in Utah. He brought his son with him to pick it up. And I had another uh, uh, pastel drawing I'd done of, of, of where they live. Okay, it was down in Monticello, Utah. And uh, his kid says to me, you paint the same thing over and over again. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I had to remind him that, uh, and Cezanne did a, a lot, and uh, uh, Monet, and, 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 and the Impressionists painted the same thing over and over and over again, many times, uh, you know, working uh, that motif and, and, and reinvestigating uh, the kinds of things that are happening. So I think, it, I mean, for me, painting on the uh, high desert up by, on the borderline of Arizona, Utah, or the Santa Fe is really maybe my favorite place to paint, or at least I get 
uh, motivated by the by the landscape up there and also the sky. And you, you always talk about landscape and you think, oh, what's you know, I, I have people who want to do commissions and they say to me, I say to them, what do you want to do? You want to do the land or do you want to do the sky? What's going to what's going to be uh, uh, the important thing in the painting? What's going to do the talking? Uh, and I find that, that in, in that world out there, uh, uh, there's some, there's amazing sky, amazing color, the same in the in, 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 in the landscape. You know. uh, and so, I'm, for some reason, I'm just magnetically attracted to that area. Oh, it's, so, hey. it's beautiful, and you don't you say your colors don't necessarily represent reality, but that color of blue sky, I've seen that. Yeah. So, and there's a certain color, I've said this before, like just after sunset, just after dusk here, the sky gets that navy, turquoise, green, blue. Well, you know, when you paint uh, this, the sunsets down here in, in Scottsdale, which is fantastic, uh, when you look at them in photograph, it's hard to paint them as bright as they really are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and people would say, oh, man, is that it? I mean, one day Greg just said, "Where's that? Where's that painting from Mars?" <laughs> and uh, uh, I told him, "You know, Greg, go out there and look." And you, I mean, sometimes uh, you can't believe how warm the red or, or the kinds of formations that are happening in nature. Um, I, I mean, we can hardly do them justice, but uh, uh, it's always inspiring to I me mean, to, to see that the horizon and what's happening both below and above. Uh, this concept of, of uh, uh, chaos and calm is, a, is an interesting con uh, contrast uh, when I look at the landscape. And I kind of seek it out uh, to have that uh, juxtaposition between the explosive sky and a stable uh, ground surface system. Oh, yeah, you can definitely see that. And I like also what you said about the, the opposite complementary colors really make each other stronger. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Think about that, yeah. So, is there any painting you sold that you wish you kept? Uh, yeah. I have a weird story. <laughs> um, I used to dance for years and years, but when I was pre my first dancing recital, you know, I, I when my uh, when my dad passed away, you know, there's this whole drawer of photos, and way later we all go through them. And I found this little picture of my dad taking it at a dance recital, you know, and I'm one of six little girls up there, all their legs different directions, you know. And, um, <laughs> and I just decided to paint it out of the blue, so and see if I could paint like a shade line, you know, just for fun. So I did, I did this little painting, then I did the second one because I had a second picture, and then uh, our banker wanted to buy it, and I was like. I don't know. I don't know if I should sell these. I'm, it's like I'm looking through my dad's eyes, you know. It's like I wasn't quite sure if I could give up these candies. She said, no, I really do. I want to buy both. And I'd actually made a mistake in the second one. I reached for my black, which I don't think either, instead of uh, a paint gray. So that it was a little, they still look a lot like, but you could, I could tell the shadows were just a little bit blacker in the one than the other, you know. And, well, they don't even go together. And she's like, no, I do. I really want to buy both. We're going to put them on either side of, you know, this whatever. And, uh, I told them to her, and I, I go over and I go to hang them. She lives three doors down from where I live at that age. Oh, it was the weirdest thing. And I just, I thought that was so weird. They went home. My whole baby went home. So anyway, anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. But I really think in general, my my paintings are my kids. I want them all to be loved and in good homes. But I am not supposed to keep them. So that's how I feel about them. You know, I I came to this show. I I've been to a, a private bank show. Uh, and had a bunch of paintings there. There's a, a, a painting that was there, about 18 by uh, 24. And I had I had uh, resurrected this painting about 20 times. And uh, I had sanded it off, I'd scraped it, I, I painted over it, messed it up again, couldn't get it right over and over and over again. And had it in my studio for honestly about six years. Uh, and so I really never gave up on it, although there were times that it spent six and seven months without any work on it. So uh, it ended up looking pretty darn good when I got some. It was a, it was a painting of fields and a stream, the light coming over in the morning. And this lady walks up to me and said, which is your favorite painting here? And I said, well, 
I hate to tell you, but it's this little one down here. And she says, oh, I was thinking the same thing. Uh, and uh, she said to me, it was kind of interesting. Uh, I told her how I'd messed it up so many times and I kind of resurrected it. And she said to me, you know, that painting is just like life. Uh, things go bad, but you pick yourself up. Things get messed up, but you fix them. You keep on, you keep on. And uh, I said, you know, that's awesome. Uh, and she says, I said, are you really interested in buying it? She said, no. <laughs> she says, I have learned never to buy anything without my uh, involving my husband. So she didn't buy it. And, uh, and so I'm at another uh, one of these private shows, and she brought her husband in. I still had the painting. And so she, they come up, and they look, and they look, and they look. And uh, she says, honey, what do you think? Which one should we buy? She says, well, let's buy this one, this one, and this one. And he says to her, which one do you want? I thought. Here we go. We're going to get rid of this, this painting, my favorite painting. And she looks around and buys another small one over there. So I still have the painting. I bring it down to celebration the, the next year. And uh, some really pretty sophisticated painters, or, excuse me, uh, uh, painters came in and they have a beautiful collection of stuff from here. Uh, and, and the lady, uh, said again to me, what's your favorite painting? And I gave her the story. And she says, uh, do you really feel like you want to sell that? I said, yeah, I'm ready. And she bought it. That yeah. it. So I kind of wish I still had it, you know what I mean? Because of all of the, all of the background. There's a lot of them that you sell that you think, man, my wife cried when that one left the living room. <laughs> I had turned it on. Um, okay. Do I always like to make sure we have time for questions? Um, I want to thank all of you. We have time. I'm not wrapping up, but I just want to thank you guys for making the world such a more beautiful place by sharing your beautiful art with us. And we'd love to hear if we have questions. I know we have some of our. Yes. Yeah. Have any of you? The, the McDowell's or the sunrises that we have? Have any of you painted the McDowell's or the Arizona sunrises? Yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely do. I, I do a lot of custom art for people and they sunsets are when they always want sunrises and sunsets. And the McDowell's are where I walk a lot here, so I would have photos for them. They're beautiful. Uh, some reasons for sure, the McDowell's I'm still working on. <laughs> I've done commissions of sunrises. I never seem to be up and look at the window that time of day. But uh, Mountain Hills, I've done some from there. And uh, they have you, a, a lady that I've done a couple for came in and she filled her house up and everything. But uh, she came in and showed me some pictures that she had just taken uh, looking out towards Red Mountain. Uh, that up on it, but they were sensational. As great as the sunsets, maybe even a little brighter, yeah. but they don't last very long. So no, they don't. The sunrises are great, though. Uh, I remember. Um, ten, no, at least ten years ago, we went with Kirk Randall and his son Jamie to Cape Cod, where Edward Hopper had his summer home. One of our collectors, it, it was his family owned this home now, and it had this big, like, eight foot by 12 foot window that was positioned just so he could see, have the sunlight come in and, and see the view. And we we had the pleasure of just watching the sunset. We were on the Cape, but we were, so we were facing west and watching the sunset over the, the, the is it called? the bay, whatever, whatever the cape is surrounding. I'm like, wow, we're on the East Coast watching a sunset, like going into the waters if I'm, in, you know, on the West Coast watching it. But it was all about the light there and just watching the change. And like every minute, it, it was not mountains, but the fields, it was in October, just watching the light change and the color. And there was a story about Edward Hopper would always stay through October because he liked to be there after the people were gone. And I, I wrote the article and I said, I think it was more about watching that light change and that magical time 
in the fall. But you know, to capture that is is a gift. So that was a good a good question for us. Anyone else? I'm going to try to. Yeah. I told myself that I would not ask a question tonight <laughs> because I typically ask a question. But these are such inspirational stories uh, that we appreciate so much because we learn so much. But Becky, is that okay? okay. I, did I hear correctly that you are intrigued by the Chica Terra? Yeah. Okay. Now, I, what I see here are landscapes. I love the Chica Terra. Okay. Uh, Renaz, I mean, it's fantastic. Have you ever painted an airy picture? Because every painting, there's some on the other side of the Chica Terra that I've ever seen, is detailed. It's yeah. beautiful. It's wonderful. Yeah, it, it articulates all, all the, 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 the power. Have you ever painted the Chicken Terra in this kind of ethereal atmosphere? And are they here tonight? They are not here. But um, I did for a while. I was doing a lot of Portofino, which is just right by there, too. Yeah. I love the way all the lights on the harbors reflect in the water. But see, I. One time I had to do, um, I was working on a big harbor painting, and I had all those boats in the photo this woman gave me, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get those boats. And I had the sun set in, and it was reflecting in the water, and I drew, painted in the dock, and suddenly there's all the boats. Um, and I actually had the weirdest thing happen. I got this, I took these two days ago, I was thinking about it. I just heard this low voice say, paint the light, not the boats. And so I just painted how the light is hitting the Boats. And I stopped thinking about the boats all together and we stood back and there they were. Put some mats in there and I was like, okay. <laughs> and so I realized then you really don't have to take detail to get the idea across. And then people can fill in the story. So for Chico Terra, if you're close up to the buildings, it's tricky because you, the details right there, it's hard to not do it. But if you can get a distant shot of Chico Terra and that Riviera, you can do a very, very, <laughs> yeah, I don't have any right now. But you could. I could, yes. Yeah, they all do commission work, but yeah. I, uh, that's a good question. And I love that answer. Paint the light, not the boat. The way it hits the boat. Okay. Good one. Well, Becky, I have seen you paint before, and it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. But I don't recall. I use big brushes too, but just barely. I mess it up when I get my brushes out. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's a, a spatula, not just a palette. Like, <laughs> like you're going to flip me in cakes, right? And I cut a really big birthday cake with it too here in the second one. <laughs> That was good. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the tools are, the palettes are fascinating, but so are the tools, because there's a there's a million ways to to put, put this down on canvas, and you guys have covered pretty much most of us. Um, any other questions, anybody? Okay. Yes. This isn't a question, but being from a fairy girl from Canada, Flying over in small airplanes that are the airplanes, we have captured the distance and the endless horizon and the beauty of all of that. And it is just spectacular. It really is. And I love Becky's, Becky's, uh, you know, paintings because every time I go there, I just go. It totally relaxes me. It must be because I'm breathing air. And I never recognized that before, but I just have always felt it was floating and it was just what it was. Beautiful. And then Susie, you do wonderful things with your color through the waters and, and, and just reproducing what the sun is. I just want to say it was just awesome. Thank you. You know, somebody passed away here, Ed Mel. Yep. Who's, uh, about you. Uh, a tremendous painter uh, and, and uh, 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 favorite son of Scottsdale. He lived right. Yeah. His I was say, you can with say things a lot too. Like, yeah, I mean, people say, "Oh, a little bit about Mel." I said, "Yeah, I've heard 
proud to say that it's a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. And he really pioneered the uh, painting from a, uh, uh, from a uh, high perspective, shooting pictures out of helicopters all over all over Arizona and Utah, which were which are fantastic. Mm -hmm. I had two architects from Chicago come in years ago, and they said to me, "I had a painting like this," and they said to me, "Where's your perspective?" <laughs> and, and, I, and I said to him, he, does it look like it's receding or no? And I said, well, I, where's your perspective? And I said, it's, it's all about uh, a, the painting technique of making things softer in the background, less detail in the background, lighter colors, you know, more detail in the foreground, brighter colors. And I said, that's the perspective. I said, you guys have been uh, drawing buildings way too long. <laughs> I need to, you need to wake up and look at a painterly perspective. So, uh, but it is a but but it's a, a beautiful thing to. I, I, we used to go up to Banff, Canada, play golf a lot up there in ball. And uh, one year, my wife and I, we decided to drive up because I'd never been all the way from Montana. And uh, it was one of the most beautiful things to drive through Idaho, Montana, all the way up to the border into Banff. Uh, Banff and, and uh, up there in Canada, way too many people in America have not visited Canada. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. But to see those gigantic wheat fields and the yellow and, and the color and the little bit of detail where the, where there will be some buildings and some uh, uh, little uh, organizations uh, of, of architecture uh, within the landscape. I had a guy from Texas come in a few weeks ago and said, we own 37,000 acres in Odessa, Texas. And he said, these are uh, oil fields, but we also run 300 head of cattle. He said, if I got you some, and we have drones that watch after it all, all the time. He says, if I get you some really good footage, could you paint our ranch from an aerial perspective? I think it'd be a cool thing to do, uh, and and to intermingle the beautiful uh, natural uh, landforms with the constructed buildings uh, that the humans put in. I, if he pulls it pulls it off or gets it going, it, it'll be a fun fun one to do. Yeah, that'd be fun to, yeah. to follow that. Yeah, sure. Very good. Uh, yeah, I think I do. A little ebb and out, but you're way more <laughs> more texture. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he paints pretty flat. Pretty, yeah, pretty. Uh, but uh, <laughs> terrible to lose, Ed. What a great. Uh, yeah. If you follow his career, I mean, he's a fantastic painter. Started out as a graphic designer, came back and and uh, and, and really, he's he's a little bit like Maynard Dixon to the Southwest. Uh, kind of a modern influence in, in a very, very big way. Yeah. When he came out to Santa Fe, he fell in love with the the light in the air and in that atmosphere there. The spirit, there we go again. Yeah. But yeah, then he became more of the Scott Steele brand. But um, influence, I think, you know, everybody, we're all influenced by somebody and there's so many great artists who've come before and you know we'd be silly if we didn't draw on that inspiration um that's why we're still talking about Cezanne and Van Gogh and all the all the greats we've done yeah starting that yes like I'm sure all of you can you paint a night sky and use uh plastic for the white stars I am working on that right now. I'm trying to do a nighttime scene of Canyon Lake, a different spot. Uh, there's a gentleman who came in uh, a couple weeks ago, and he he really likes the Canyon Lake painting I have, but then he's like, if you could do a night scene. And I'm like, well, I would, but I don't have any references. So he sent me a whole bunch of emails. And um, using that, but then also just playing with all the colors and the lights. And I am using masking fluid. So I started a lot of fun. I'm down to the white. We have a couple of things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. I, the white of the paper is always wetter than any paint. Um, I could always speckle it on, you know, uh, with a, a 
Chinese white or white gouache, but it won't be the same. Uh, another way that I've done stars in the past, and I might be doing it for this one, is salt. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so if you get what? salt. And salt. Yeah, just normal table salt oh, or uh, a larger grain salt. Um, and you just kind of toss it on when it's about you know, 40, 30 to 40% dry. And then um, the salt will push away the pigments, kind of like um, pepper and olive oil. We'll do, or pepper and salt. Oil and vinegar. Oil and vinegar. Yeah. They kind of push each other away. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a nice little piece. Yeah. So we'll look for a starry night from Susie. <laughs> we'll look for a, a aerial shot geography from Martin and uh, Chikatero from you. Aerial. I think we should have a lot of things off of this one. From my side. I don't know if you'd seen hers, which kind of surprised me this year. Yeah. Uh, because there, she's got some dark paintings that are nice. I have to take a look at them. Yeah. Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. You guys, very inspirational, educational. Um, want to thank our panel, and I do want to thank.